On today's World Inside, Afghanistan at a crossroads, the situation and big challenges on the ground months after the hasty retreat of U.S.-led forces from the country. Where is Afghanistan headed now? And a closer look at lives shattered by the war in Afghanistan, a former U.S. Marine, an Afghan refugee doctor, and two veterinarians, their inspiring stories of survival. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. It's been more than three months since the U.S.-led NATO forces hastily withdrew from the Afghanistan and the Taliban swept back to power. Violence and terrorism still plague the country, though. Terrorist-linked explosions have hit many places, while the U.N. warns the extremist group ISKP has grown and now appears in nearly all 34 provinces of Afghanistan. Most Afghans face terrorism, poverty, and food insecurity on top of a collapsing economy. Today, we bring you a series of my interviews lately on Afghanistan. First up, Suhail Shahin, the Taliban spokesperson, and Wang Yu, the Chinese ambassador to Afghanistan. I'm joined by Suhail Shahin. Taliban political office spokesman in Qatar. Mr. Shaheen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We are Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. For the last 20 years, uh, we were fighting the occupation in our country under the name of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. But of course, our deliberation are continuing. It is underway. A delegation headed by Mulasa Biradar, uh, he landed in Kandahar province mm -hmm. uh, for uh, that purpose, in order to uh, form an Afghan inclusive Islamic government after consultation with the top leadership of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. You promised, I mean, Taliban, to have an inclusive government. Would that mean all factions, all ethnicities, all genders, and also all religion? What kinds of inclusiveness is exactly the description uh, negotiation which is continuing uh, it is considering all afghans all afghans are uh, considered but uh, then they will select uh, some personalities which is uh, suitable um, uh, for to be included uh, in the in the future government so that is the general uh, framework sir i also want to know and many have this issue as well around the world, whether what you're saying right now are total PR stunt, only for public relations, whether you are really going to implement what you promises. So uh, we have this record. What we say, we do that. Mm. How are you in contact with various uh, countries uh, at this moment? Uh, for example, uh, the United States? Russia, China, Iran, Pakistan, India, and the list goes on. What are you doing in terms of reaching out to the others? Yes, uh, we, some of uh, the countries you mentioned, we have been in touch with them for many years here at the political office. We have regular meeting with them. We, were, uh, we are, uh, have been exchanging views over the uh, situation of Afghanistan, we, they were uh, helping us uh, and uh, in the process of peace and reconciliation. So that uh, contacts uh, are still continuing. In recent months, the situation in Afghanistan has devolved rapidly and the security situation has become increasingly complex and severe. 
especially on August 15, the situation in the capital, Kabul, has undergone a sudden change, unstable and uncertain. Under the leadership and wise decision of the CPC Central Committee, our embassy in Afghanistan upholds people-centered diplomatic principles and regards the safety of the lives of compatriots in Afghanistan as the top priority. We need early judgments and security reminders, so many Chinese citizens have been evacuated by various means from Afghanistan. After August 15th, due to the suspension of commercial flights at Kabul International Airport and the chaos at the airport, some remaining Chinese citizens wanted to leave Afghanistan but faced difficulties. The embassy actively assisted them in contacting the channels of departure from Afghanistan and helping them with visas in embassies of other countries. For the few people who stayed voluntarily, the embassy kept in close contact with them, asked them to mind security, reminding them many times to strictly abide by local religious customs on clothing, dining, and public speech. Meanwhile, we tell them to stay away from areas where security cannot be guaranteed, such as Kabul airport. Countries keep evacuating citizens, mainly due to worries over the future. The embassy also actively communicated with the Taliban in Afghanistan. The Taliban promised to ensure the safety of Chinese citizens, institutions, and corporate property in Afghanistan, and issued safety guarantee letters to some Chinese citizens in need. I also asked the ambassador about his take on cooperation between China and Afghanistan, including under the Belt and Road Initiative. The two countries are linked by mountains and rivers. The friendship between the two peoples goes back to ancient times, and the economic and trade cooperation between the two countries is developing steadily. In recent years, Afghanistan has exported more than 3,000 tons of pine nuts, worth more than 34 million U.S. dollars to China, through the Arab-China Air Cargo Corridor. Saffron, carpets, and other specialty products are also being shipped to China. China has also lent support and assistance to Afghanistan's infrastructure construction and the well-being of the people's livelihood by building hospitals, universities, etc. I tweeted about China helping Kabul University build an auditorium and a teaching building. Thousands of Afghan netizens left comments and thumbs up. They praised the new beautiful building and thanked China. In addition, since the outbreak of COVID-19 in Afghanistan last year, China has shown support by shipping oxygen machines, ventilators, testing reagents, vaccines, and other supplies that Afghanistan urgently needs, making its contribution to Afghanistan's fight against the pandemic. It is fair to say that Afghanistan has reaped benefits and early harvest from the Belt and Road Initiative. In the future, China will continue to uphold the vision of a community with a shared future for mankind, promote connectivity between Afghanistan and the region, help Afghanistan leverage its geographical advantages, and deliver more benefits to the Afghan people. Finally, in the interview, I asked the ambassador about how China can play a positive role in Afghanistan's reconstruction, peace and reconciliation process, and regional stability. The Afghan people, suffering from war and turmoil, long for peace. In response to the recent rapid changes in the situation, the top Chinese leader and the Chinese foreign minister have had phone calls and meetings with leaders of many other countries. The special envoy of the foreign ministry on Afghanistan affairs has also attended several international meetings on Afghanistan. China stressed that China respects Afghanistan's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. China will insist on the policy of non-interference in Afghanistan's internal affairs and will play a constructive role in the political settlement of the Afghan issue. China is ready to step up communication and coordination with all parties of the international community, encourage all factions in Afghanistan to build an open and inclusive political architecture through consultation, implement moderate and prudent domestic and foreign policies, completely cut off ties to all terrorist organizations and live in friendly relations with all countries in the world, especially neighboring countries. The Chinese embassy in Afghanistan will follow the instructions of the leaders, continue to closely follow the evolution and development of the situation, contact with various factions, promote the cause of China-Afghanistan friendship, and continue to help Chinese citizens in Afghanistan to resolve difficulties within its capacity. This is World Insight. Coming up, 
A closer look at lives shattered by the war in Afghanistan, the stories of a former U.S. Marine, an Afghan refugee doctor, and two veterinarians. Their inspiring stories of survival. Back, this is World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Although armed conflict is no longer rampant, Afghanistan's four-decade-old refugee crisis remains a serious concern. China recently voiced the support for the UN in playing a bigger role in aiding Afghanistan and called for joint efforts from the international community to provide humanitarian assistance. The Taliban response and that of the international community can help ease the economic and humanitarian crisis. I earlier talked to some people who survived the war, telling us their stories of struggle and inspiration. First up, meet Memo Mata, a U.S. Marine who served in Afghanistan, and Salima Rahman, a refugee doctor, and the two Afghan veterinarians, Faridun and Shamali. How have Afghans uprooted by conflict going to survive and get on with their lives? What can be done to help them pick up the pieces? Here are their stories. During the darkest moment of my life, I realized I was meant to be an educator. I, I saw a teacher do something amazing in the class in the middle of a battle. In Afghanistan. Yeah, and um, the teacher's giving a math class. And uh, when the battle starts, an old Afghan teacher stands up. And it's a classroom with no windows, half a roof, and bullet holes everywhere. And three meters out the window, people are shooting. And this teacher, when the battle starts, and is mill in the classroom, stands up calmly, claps his hands twice. All the students stood up, took their desks, put it on the side, and they get down their little bellies, kids from five to 12, and they continued the lesson. Wow. They are, there's screams outside, and there's loss of life, and these kids are in the lesson, and the teacher had their attention and the whole world did not exist. And so, at that moment, knowing that teacher said, that's what I want to be. I keep a journal. And so, um, basically, uh, I actually wrote a timeline of my first tour, uh, just to remember. So, uh, it was the Panjshir Valley in the north. And we kind of made our way uh, into, um, into the Mosai Sharif and, and took that place, um, Kabul. Uh, and then we did a, a, a big um, conflict was in uh, Kanduz. Uh, and, then, and then moving down, it was, um, we went finally uh, down to uh, Kandahar. That was kind of like the last place. Um, and during this time, I think it was like December, um, there was a push for, uh, 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 of the Taliban that came in from the south, uh, and, and, and it was the Shaikat Valley, and, and that one kind of, you know, it, it was not a big issue up to that point. We were taking places pretty easy, but um, it was there that that um, that that was really um, tough, and, and it kind of opened our eyes a bit. Um, when, 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 when you go in there and you're trying to train people, uh, the Afghan army, the people who are supposed to be next to, 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 the, to the U.S. coalition, right? And these guys would come in in bright blue pickup trucks and headlights just getting picked off from the Taliban who were coming in. So right away, uh, you, you saw that there were problems between how the U.S. was training these guys <laughs> because, you know, the adversary was no joke, um, and, and they were veterans. They were hardened, trained warriors up against farmers and, and tribesmen and things like this. So um, 
without any coalition there, I don't see how the country could have sustained them off for very long. At that time, you already smell it already? Yeah, well, Somewhat. Look, in the military, they call this grunts. What does that mean? A grunt means you're just a brainless person on the ground ordered to fight. Um, so I'm just a grunt. I have never been an officer. Um, I'm not a political expert. I'm not a military expert. Uh, all I got are my memories. You've ever been in touch with your friends, colleagues? I still stay in touch with quite a few of my old Marines. How are they doing? Um, th there's a scale from very good to very bad. Um, unfortunately, um, the Marines that I stay in touch with um, are, are mostly on the very bad side, uh, even 20 years later. Really? Um, well, look, um, it, it's memories that wake you up at night um, in cold sweats. It's memories. Um, my biggest problem was sleepless nights. For over 20 years, I don't think I've slept more than four hours. Really? Even today. Um, you know, good two, three, four hours every night. Um, and and, 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 and in the beginning, it, it was tearing me apart. Oh, I was so tired, and, and I was going crazy, and, 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 and I saw myself going down a path that would take me away from my sons. So I said, okay. By that time, you know, I was a single daddy. Um, I wanted to be part of their lives. I wanted to do everything I can to give them a bright future. I couldn't do that if I went down a dark place like other veterans did. Um, but you cannot afford that because no. you got them too. I, I, I had to find ways to overcome. You were born in the refugee camp and it was your father who struggled and made all the things happening, right? Tell me more about that. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, the story starts with my father actually because he was the one uh, who uh, fled the uh, Russian war in 1979. Uh, he fled the war and came to Pakistan to seek refuge. He found refuge in Sawabi refugee camp in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Pakistan, where he uh, started uh, living his life as refugee uh, along with his relatives. And uh, initially he started to sell fruits uh, in the day and uh, in the night he uh, started making uh, designs and weaving rugs. Um, uh, that's what our uh, Turkman families do at their home. And he, he was not able to get his own education. He, uh, then he realized that uh, I was not able to get education, but I will make sure that my children will get education. He uh, persuade community members to send your daughters to uh, send your children to school, uh, which was in a refugee school free of cost. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he actually advocated for it because we are already refugees and we need education for our livelihood, for our better future. You made your dream real, but with a lot of challenges. I understand even in Pakistan, in the, in the refugee camps, uh, people are still not used to girls going to universities and becoming a professional doctor. So how did your family and yourself, while you grew up, try to deal with those difficulties? Yeah, you are right. It was uh, very uh, difficult and I, ha I had to face so many obstacles and challenges during my journey. Uh, first of all, uh, first of all, I had to uh, I had to break the barriers uh, of my community because I belong to a very conservative community, uh, which is a Turkmen community, uh, in which women are not allowed to go to school and get education. Uh, it, it's uh, not prioritized. The basic needs of getting food and um, 
basic uh, facilities is being prioritized, but education is kept uh, secondary. So uh, I was the one who broke the barrier to uh, get higher education and to get medical education from my community. I was the first one. And uh, uh, being a refugee, it was also a challenge for me. I had no guidance. I had uh, uh, no female uh, role model to look up to in my community. So um, I was the uh, first one. I had to explore the opportunities and uh, uh, the uh, way to, um, uh, to uh, make my dream of becoming a doctor real. What about women now living in the refugee camps? Would they have access to hygiene uh, have access to medical help if they need it? Uh, uh, as I have told you that uh, our community and um, our refugees uh, are living below the poverty line, most of the refugees. So uh, the, their personal hygiene and mental and physical health is so compromised. They are the vulnerable population, but they have... Uh, access to uh, free uh, access to uh, healthcare public sectors but uh, those living far away from those public uh, sectors they face problems in transportation uh, in searching uh, searching some uh, interpreter right. uh, translator so they face these kind of barriers. Uh, they have no access to proper nutrition. That's why they are suffering from uh, decreased uh, hemoglobin level, which is uh, called as anemia, is most prevalent among these women. And uh, most of uh, them suffer from mental illness uh, due to the family restrictions and uh, 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 domestic violence and uh, ongoing situations uncertainty everything makes them vulnerable and their mental health is being compromised in my clinic when they come to see me i offer them uh, counseling sessions uh, regarding their personal hygiene and mental health and uh, moreover i am i have uh, uh, specialized trained in gynecologist so mm -hmm. i uh, i deal with most of the expecting mothers what kind of training you received and how are you helping the locals are you happy with your job before receiving the training, I was working as a farmer in the village. I was struggling to earn a meager amount to pay for my daily expenses. And at that time, through the Club Coochie project staff, I was introduced to a six-month professional training course. The China Club Training Center, which was located in Parwan province in Afghanistan. Here I pursued six-month professional training on animal husbandry and AI. After completing the training, the project provided me with technical kits, which included all the equipment which is necessary for a professional person to work in animal husbandry or to work far away in the field. Along that, the project established a veterinary field building and provided me with a motorcycle to travel to the village. Also, the project established a feed bank through which I produced concentrated feed, which can be provided to livestock keepers in the village level. Through that, the people are very happy. What is the people you are helping with, uh, the kind of assignment you had recently? My current assignment is to serve both local and Kuchi livestock keepers in the village. I have distributed my phone numbers through a business card. When the livestock keepers face any problem, they call me. And then I travel by motorcycle, which is provided through the project to the village. Then I take care of the animal and provide vaccines or deworming, etc., whatever the problem is. Here I can solve them and help the livestock keeper take away that problem. A lot of people calling on you and also you must be a good uh, motorcycle rider because you've been going to so many different places, huh? I am a busy person in the village. Is your wife uh, happy about that situation? I mean, you're always on the phone, always going somewhere. She is really happy because I'm getting more income through serving the people. That's good. So how much do you earn a month? 
On average, I earn 20,000 AFs per month. Pretty good. How do you and your colleagues are, deal with, are dealing with the instability in the country and the change of politics all the time over the years? Uh, this is a little bit uh, political, creation, political creation, but you know, uh, our, our professional, uh, we all, I am veterinarians, Shamali is part of it, but I am veterinarians, I am graduating from veterinary faculty, also uh, more than 20 years experience in, in this field. Uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, 1988, uh, Dutch community uh, start work from Peshawar. From that time till now, uh, too many changes happen in Afghanistan. But to one thing, very sustainable work of Paravet and veterinary people in the field. You know, this our work is not uh, political. Uh, nobody, nobody is more disturbing in our work because we work with a very poor community in the field. Always we provide a veterinary surveys and support to very poor people. This is the one thing still, you know, we have too many examples of uh, Shamali in the all provinces of Afghanistan. We have Paravet, they received training 20, 25 years ago, but still he is working in the field. He is provide veterinary service to the farmer because you know that before the Taliban also, the Club Kuchi project coverage area, 50% of 50%, more than 50% of our Farawet were work uh, that time is also in Taliban area because Taliban, most of the Taliban is also, they have the living start. They have very good relation with our Farawet. They also call for the treatment, for vaccination, for deworming. Also Kuchi people, Kuchi people is mobile. Most of them is mobile. They, their lifestyle is mobile because yeah. they use, they stay three months in this place, three months in the mountain area. Uh, you know, th this business is very sustainable business in Afghanistan. And that's the latest the series of interviews I did on the issue of Afghanistan. All fresh stories from the front line. That's all we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. And bye for now.